Welcome to Noble Warrior. This is a place where entrepreneurs talk about what it takes to create and scale purpose-driven organizations. We're going to talk about mindset. We're going to talk about mental models. We're going to talk about actionable tactics such that you can take everything you learn and go out and create and scale your purpose organization. My name is CK Lin. Biomedical engineering PhD from UCLA that turned startup executive that was part of a founding team, went from an idea to a company, 200 plus employees that turned executive coach, focusing on helping founders around their mindset and culture. My next guest is a pioneer in humanitarian architecture. He's a former co-founder of Architecture for Humanity, director of Jolie Pitt Foundation, Head of Social Innovation for Airbnb. Currently, the founder of Frontline Care that brings shelter solutions to take care of frontline healthcare workers. Please welcome Cameron Sinclair. Hi, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you so much for being here, Cameron. Really appreciate it. I know you're a busy well, guy. I, I, this is the first time I've done one of these from in the middle of the woods. So I feel like... Uh, it's going to be an experience for both of us. Amazing. <laughs> I love it. So why don't I actually start off from the founding stories of Architecture for Humanity? Can you tell us that story real quick? You know, the time where you called the yeah. UN? Well, there's the short, short version, which is the UN version, but then there's the origins of that, of that founding thing. And, and we can talk about that later, but, you know, back in... 1999, I happened to be designing buildings in Romania as an architect and working for an architecture firm. And at the same time, Kosovo was happening and hundreds of thousands of people being forced from their homes into Albania and Montenegro. And my graduate thesis was on about how to house people in a transitional and temporary way. And I kind of felt that as a young designer, I had a moral and ethical obligation to help the community that I'm in. And the community I happened to be in were being displaced. And that my entire graduate work was about how to help displace people. So I was kind of like, this is what I was built to do. And I have, you know, as a global designer, I have a responsibility to figure out how I can support and help those who are being displaced. Two important things happened that particular year. One was called Google, and the other was called eternal optimism, which is, I, for whatever reason, I ended up embracing this idea of being internally optimistic and believing the possible. And so I went into Google and I typed United Nations, refugees, Kosovo, New York, and up popped a phone number for the UNHCR's offices. And I called the number and I said, I'm a designer. I have this idea about how to house people in a five to 10 year timeline during and post conflict. And I'd like to speak to whoever's in charge of refugees. And the guy on the phone said, well, that's kind of me. What do you want? And so I, I pitched him the full idea and he said, this is remarkable for two reasons. One, you're the first architect to call this office in years. And two, it's a pretty good idea. And so could you come to the office and could you present your idea with your firm? But back then I was in my early twenties. I didn't have a firm. I just had a bunch of buddies that we used to drink with. And so I said, listen, I'll buy you all beers if you pretend to be a firm and come to the UN with me. And so we went to the UN with white shirts and black trousers and black ties thinking that's what architects should look like. And we presented this idea and I was very passionate about the idea of internally displaced refugees, people that were stuck in their own country, couldn't have, have shelter in, in, a, in a country that didn't have the resources to support them. And at the time, the UN didn't deal with internally placed refugees. They didn't even document them. And so they said, well, listen, we can't help you, but here are a bunch of organizations that can. And so I began to pursue the idea of supporting these you know, internally displaced refugees. And I called up the editor of an architecture magazine, a guy called Robert Ivey, who's now the head of the American Institute of Architects. And by the way, the guy who picked up the phone at the UN was a guy called Andreas Gutierrez, who's now the secretary general of the UN. And so like, you know, these things happen. And so 
Robert Ivey, I told him this idea. I said, I'm a young designer. I have this idea. I have these contacts in Kosovo and Montenegro and Albania, and I want to be able to do this housing solution. And if I do it, could you publish it? Because I think it's important to have this conversation about the role of the architect. And his response was, well, actually, who cares? Like, to be honest, like, you're not actually helping anyone. You're just really helping yourself. And, and architects don't really want to help other people. They have clients and they get hired and they build the buildings. And he was just trying to antagonize me. I didn't know that at the time, but he wanted to just see how passionate I was about oh, he was idea. testing you. Yeah, he was testing me. He just wanted to say, was I some young kid looking for some publishing, you know, something in a magazine? And by the, t by the end of the phone call, which was laden with quite a few expletives because I was getting very passionate about my feelings towards architecture, I slammed the phone down and I said, I bet there are hundreds of architects that want to help. And that night I, you know, got the Architecture for Humanity website. We started a competition to, to, to design housing for returning refugees. And we launched what was going to be a design competition called Architecture for Humanity. My co-founder, Kate Storer, and I kind of helped put it together. She was from the tech world, so she helped me with the tech side. I was from the design world. But what happened is rapidly, because we were one of the first websites that dealt with architecture and social good, we grew exponentially. And we ended up responding to dozens of issues and then hundreds and then dozens of natural disasters, then hundreds of projects. And within 15 years, we grew to the size where we had tens of thousands of, of, of pro bono architects willing to offer their services and dozens of projects happening simultaneously around the world. Thank you for sharing that origin story. I want to dive in a little bit deeper, more on the, on the beginning side of things. So in the beginning was naivete, right? You just didn't know. Yeah. And then instead of going, following the old model, that is, let me start from the bottom, middle management, and then eventually talk to the decision maker. I yeah. love that you just went, hmm, who can I call from the top? And you just went directly to the top. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But the, I didn't really even know there was a middle management, right? It's just, it was just the luck of being able to have the right person pick up the phone. And instead of saying, oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to call you let me talk to somebody else. I just pitched, right? I didn't know about pitching. I didn't know anything about entrepreneurship then. I just said, I have this idea. I have to get it out. Mm -hmm. So back, backtrack for a moment, because I'm looking at, you know, what you have accomplished your resume, so to speak, you develop shelter solutions, you develop schools for refugee children, you develop mobile HIV or now COVID health centers, you develop cultural sustainability and preservation projects. And that, in my mind, went way beyond my definition of architects. So, so I'd love to hear a little bit about what's your definition of architecture. So that takes me back earlier because I feel like I was duped into being an architect. I grew up in a very rough part of East London. There was a lot of violence. There was no trees. There wasn't this sort of surrounding. It wasn't a peaceful place. And as a young kid, I used to run away from home all the time. And I wasn't running away to get away from my parents, but I was curious about other neighborhoods in London. And so by the time I was six, seven, eight years old, I was basically going to other parts of London by myself and understanding that different urban environments resulted in different outcomes. A nice park, a well-formatted like, you know, gathering place. People were happy and they smiled and and at the time, I didn't know it was socioeconomic reasons, right? Because when you're poor, you don't think you're poor. You think your neighbor's poor, right? So no one actually said, well, Cameron, you guys come from a poor household and you live in a rough neighborhood. That's why it's so bad. I was like, why is this architecture better? And so as a six-year-old or seven-year-old, I thought maybe if you build better architecture, you could actually improve communities. And so I became an architect because I felt that it was a vessel where people discover how to become better humans. And that, that as we put things into the world, we're not just affecting the client, we're affecting everybody in that ecosystem. So when you're building something in the middle of a city, it's not just the owner of that building, it's everybody that surrounds that building that gets affected by e either positively or negatively. 
So by the time I went to architecture school, I was absolutely convinced that that's what the role of the architect was, was to either positively improve the planet or to be a detriment. And I wanted to make sure that I was going to positively improve the planet. I, I think you, you said it so beautifully because as an engineer, as a systems thinker, I always, before going big, I try my best to think about the atomic unit of whatever it is I'm building, right? So what you just said is architecture is the vessel to be better humans. So that's for you, the atomic unit of anything that you build. So within that framework, then you can build something as small as like a, like a building to all the way to mobile hospitals and units. Is that, did I hear that correctly? Yeah. And the other part of that is I feel that architecture has many authors. There's the physical architect, there's the actual person who does the drawing, but to get a building to be built takes so many people. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm right next to a house here up in upstate New York. It wasn't an architect that created this house. There were engineers, there were builders, there were community members. There were, you know, this was an old farmhouse. So there was a farmer who cared about how the setup of his house was going to look. And so had some influence in the solution. There was materials that were of the time, construction methodologies of the time that created this piece of architecture. And so it's a culmination of a, a lot of things and a very collaborative process to create the solution. And so I've always been a big proponent of a very collaborative solutions where, you know, anything that you do, CK, anything you personally do, and, and this is talking directly to you, you know, everyone loves the idea of having their name attached to it. But for me, the most beautiful thing is that in generations, people will see an idea or a solution and it will just bring delight or joy or happiness or just improve their standing. And they don't know who the name behind that is, but it turns out it's you. And so it's almost like you're paying your empathy forward. And that, you know, as someone who's an innovator or an entrepreneur, instant gratification doesn't work because then your value proposition is different. Then you say, I need a solution in the next six months because I want to win a fast company award or like, I need to get my idea out by next, you know, next month because there's some accelerator program that's going to give me $50,000 to do. Like if you figure out short-term solutions and short-term results, you have a short-term mindset. And so if you can think multi-generational that your solution will exist, then, then you've made impact because it's about multi-generational -generation, impact. Hmm. I love that. Thank you for that. So when you think about a solution, you think in terms of intergenerational solution, is that correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But so by the way, you, you don't notice, but on Noble Warrior, we talk a lot about the body, the mind, the heart, and the spirit as well. So we use spiritual terms kind of interchangeably, hope you don't mind. So our intention is to build intergenerational, intergenerational solutions. At the same time, we also live in this material world, right? Uh, we do have budgetary constraints, time constraints, and the ecosystem that we play with. So. In my mind is the yin and the yang, right? There's the intention that we want to build as well as the constraints that we have. So when you think about you, Cameron, speaking to you directly now, when you think about uh, solutions and problems, do you think in terms of, so in, let's say some Japanese corporation, they think in terms of 200 years out. So when you think about it, what do you have a, like a rubric on, okay, let's think about what level is, what extent What's the boundary of your responsibilities? Probably that's a better way to phrase it. Yeah. I mean, well, what's weird about it is that a lot of my history and my work has been in crisis and disaster. Mm. So the solution has been needed now, but mm. conceptually the idea should last way beyond that particular incident. And I can just think of a myriad. I mean, it's, it's funny. You talked about spirit when, when I was in Japan and we were rebuilding after the tsunami. We had a whole process where we were talking about reusing material that was found. And a lot of the families said, you know, in, in the kind of collaborative design process, 
that we really had to be careful about the materials that were used because some of the materials came from homes and the spirits of their ancestors occupied their homes. So they wanted to make sure that that material was used in the correct way, mm -hmm. right? As somebody who's like it doing resource management, like that's not in your equation process. So I think you have to kind of figure out like, you know, people have different values behind things. And so you have to take a very broad mind minded approach, even if like, you know, the pragmatists are just like, we need materials. Here's some materials. Let's go do this. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have to balance those two. For me, you know, long after, long after I'm gone, I'll be happy. I mean, it's even happening now. I mean, I, you know, almost, you know, you mentioned about the mobile health clinics. So, you know, almost, almost 20 years ago, we proposed the idea of doing mobile health clinics to combat HIV AIDS in sub-Saharan Africa. Rapid testing, you know, all the things that are actually like in parallel to the COVID-19 crisis here in the US and elsewhere. At that time, I adopted the idea of open sourcing technology and the ability to share and distribute that and working with Creative Commons. And because of that work, actually putting a kind of Creative Commons open source license on the mobile clinics, we ended up getting the TED Prize, right? Mm -hmm. Which is like, you know, it was at the time a very big deal. And for us, we never knew, I thought it was a person. I didn't even know it was a conference, right? I thought it was a guy called Ted giving prizes, right? And so, you know, my co-founder and I, you know, when we did that, you know, we ended up doubling down in the kind of open source world for architecture. But fast forward 20 years, you know, I've met people that have said, hey, you've got really awesome ideas. You should go give a TED talk. Right. You know, like there's been such separation between like there was a moment in my life where there was a lot of attention and honor paid to the work we did. And I was very fortunate and thankful for that moment in time. But now we've gone so far beyond that. That's history. And, to, mm. and for many people who are young practitioners, they actually don't even know this history that I had 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So it's not just intergenerational, it's almost kind of, you know, once you start doing the same thing for multiple decades, it's an evolution of thought. And you have to remember that some people weren't along the beginning of the journey. They're just meeting you at a certain point in your journey. So sometimes it's in the now. But to be honest, my timeline, I would probably say is 50 to 100 years is a basic, like, another lifetime beyond me that like the day I pass away that someone could be born the next day. And at some point in the future, they might discover something that I worked on like that to me is a success. Mm -hmm. If it's somebody who just like, you know, read a book that we did, th that's great. And it inspires them, but it, it hasn't made the impact that the idea should have made. Mm. I mean, that's actually one of the reasons why that inspired me to start this podcast in the first place. Because I have really smart conversations with smart, motivated, or accomplished individuals all the time. And sometimes I have felt like, wow, it would have been really great if we had recorded that. And now in perpetuity can help others who are thinking about humanitarian architecture or, you know, grappling with their own internal doubt, self-doubt and things like that. With that said, one of the things that I walk away from my ceremonial work is like, man, it, it's, it's challenging enough to be a, a human in this living in this reality. And I have a huge admiration for people who want to take on other people's challenges, like nurses, doctors, therapists, but looking at you and the body of work that you've done when disasters happen, most people say, all right, let me be as far away as possible. You run into the disaster with your laptop and designs and trying to help. So I'm curious to know, yeah. so I'm curious to know what, what did that desire come from? And one of the things we say on this podcast quite a lot is our superpower comes from our biggest wounds. So were there something in the past that inspired you that happened that inspired you to say, Hey, when someone is in need, I'm going to help to the best of my ability. Is there any stories like that? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, and something I shouldn't mention about the, the idea of people that are frontline workers is 
there's a lot of trauma and PTSD around people that do frontline work a lot, which is why I started, you know, uh, frontline care. And even for humanitarian designers, I think like our personal lives are very challenged. You know, we end up making mistakes in the areas that everyday people are careful not to. So, you know, that's something to consider too, because, you know, you lose perspective. But in terms of a personal story, so my sister and I are almost the same age, almost identical. She's 10, 11 months older than me, as we like to say, Irish twins. And she was born with a very severe case of type 1 diabetes. Mm. And she ended up in hospital probably a couple of, a couple of months a year. And her doctor at the time said that she had a year to live. And the next year they said she had a year to live. And as a result, and quite naturally, my parents spent a lot of time and attention and care on her and gave me kind of a lot of leeway to do what I want. But it was almost like in our house, there's, there was always a conversation of finality. Mm. There was, and, and, and the fact that like, you know, and I'm sure a lot of people that watch this or, you know, have somebody in their life that, you know, gets a terminal illness or has, has a very tragic accident or has something that is really a shock, right? And it shocks everybody and everyone rallies around. But when you have someone who's so close to you and your family that is always on the edge of not making it, you come to terms with that and you begin to realize that like there are bigger issues at play and you're very thankful for the time you had. And, you know, when I started working in disasters, I began to recognize similar attributes in people that are going through a crisis where they were, they were actually much more resilient than almost anybody else I've met. I mean, I was in New York during 9-11 and folks who were downtown and in Manhattan had a much stronger resilience than people that were outside the city because their perception of the disaster was so great and they couldn't process it. Whereas when you're in it, you kind of say, okay, this is the new normal. We have to live in this, right? And here's how we're going to respond. And, you know, I, you know, I have a million stories of like, you know, during the tsunami of 2004 in Indonesia, I met a couple that asked me about designing a house and they were two people who had lost every member of their family except a couple of kids. They'd, they'd lost their spouses. And the housing for people were very basic, like a very basic wood box or metal box. But there wasn't a nuanced approach to housing for new families. And these two people, through this disaster, had fallen in love. Mm. They didn't know each other, but they had a shared situation. They had a shared trauma, which they had lost their spouses and they were trying to raise their kids. They didn't have a job. And all they were asking me as an architect to do was to design them a place where they can come together and be a new family. That is not in the humanitarian design book, right? There's no like, but what you find is like, there's such incredible resilience in this space that, you know, the real vulnerabilities are the people like us the workers, the ones that don't see the blind spots. And so can you say more about that? Unpack that for me a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I think what you do is, I mean, you're seeing this with COVID-19 right now. Mm -hmm. You know, I've spent a lot of time talking to frontline workers, doctors, nurses, other professionals that have been working in medical situations and other, and their amount of self-care is almost minimal. Every doctor I know is working extra shifts. Every doctor is like dealing with a Band-Aid solution. They're not going home and seeing their families because they don't want to infect their families. So they're sleeping in a cot bed, right? They're not figuring out, they're pushing themselves to the brink. The, there are things that are coming down the pipeline here in the United States. There are salary cuts for medical workers that are coming. These were prearranged before, right? This isn't like a surprise. Like they're going to start having medical cuts. There are closures of hospitals. There's closures of clinics. So you imagine someone who's worked tirelessly to save lives for six months suddenly loses their job. Like yeah. because they did a bad job, but because the system was already in place to er 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 eradicate their job. The amount of PTSD and issues that are going to affect these people is going to be astronomical. 
and yeah. we're not setting aside any funding for them. Yeah. We're just saying, like, let's find a cure. And I can tell you every doctor I've worked with has said, there's no way I'm telling anybody how I'm really feeling Yeah. because I'm not the person who's suffering. And I'm like, you are, <laughs> you are the person who's suffering because you're burdening the weight and the stress of everybody else on you. And so, you know, and, and this happens to people that build in disaster. This happens to anybody who's in service and crisis. And we, you know, we tend to, and I did it myself. Like I, you know, I think probably about seven years ago, I just was at my lowest. It was just unrelenting amount of work. I was traveling two to 300,000 miles a year. I was going from disaster to disaster. I had staff who needed to get paid. I had funders who wanted project. Like it was just unrelenting. And then I left my organization and, and I had to kind of reboot. And, you know, it was, it was a tough thing to walk away from in a tough time in, in the history of the organization. But, you know, I was definitely at my lowest and I learned a lot in that time period about like the blind spots that I had allowed to grow within me. And so, you know, when I see disasters, I, I see, do you, mind, I see do, you, do you mind sharing with us what you learn if it's not too personal, some of the things that you could share with us? Sure. I mean, like, I think, you know, there's a range of things of not realizing how unhappy I was in certain situations, how I was burdening myself with almost everybody else's problems, how I was not treating people um, like I'm going to give you an appalling example. I was in one disaster and I was helping rebuild some villages. These villages have been devastated. You know, there were images that will be seared into my m mind for the rest of my life, like things that you shouldn't have to see. And then I, you know, I was on my way back to the States and I happened to come to New Orleans and the Gulf Coast to meet with some folks around Hurricane Katrina. And when I got down there, it was quite a while after the flooding. So the, the, the water had, had, had receded and we were looking at it. And in my mind, I was like, it's not actually that bad. Like I had, my mind had almost corrected itself in, in what is loss. And it was almost kind of saying, well, how do I prioritize who needs help? And, you know, for me, that was a, that's a big blind spot when you ba basically have this unconscious bias about prioritized need and you be you stop doing the things that you were just part of your DNA, which is understanding um, what is the real issues on the ground? Wh what are, what are the pre-existing problems that created the disaster? Like a, a disaster isn't just a natural event. It's when a yeah, natural right. event hits a pre-existing condition. Correct. And with Katrina, it was a hurricane hitting deep poverty and racial inequity. And so, you know, I had to, I had to course correct. And when I course corrected, I overly course corrected, right? Because I, I became, I was like, it shook me up. I was like, okay, I got to do something. And I became much more of a angry activist about mm. issues rather than being a compassionate doer mm. and so i had to course correct back so it's i think it's like understanding your own flaws and i've had many over the years and i think it's taken a, a few events in my life to be more real with understanding my uh, vulnerabilities and also the other thing to note is as you go through life you really get to understand who is in your court and who is you know, they're more interested in the drama or being a part of, a, of an issue than actually a part of the solution. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's been a real interesting life lesson of like, who is actually there for you and who's willing to be compassionate and, and as empathetic with what you're going through as, of you, of, as you have been with other people. Mm -hmm. and, and that's something I missed as well, is that like, actually even last night, someone said like, people don't know 98% of the stuff you actually do that's good because you don't mm. tell anyone. Mm. Um, and the, and the 2% they do know, they question it. Mm. And so it keeps you silent, you know, about things that you're doing and, and 
you know this because we're on like WhatsApp threads where we're busy trying to help other people and saying like connect and do this. And you end up, you know, like yourself, trying to interconnect lots of people to get good stuff done, none of which has your name attached to it. You're just trying to do the right thing. Yeah. So. Well, thank you for sharing that, my friend. There's so many things I can say about that, but let me let me continue on with the thread of the conversation, if you don't mind. One thing that I think require so one thing that we do talk about on the podcast quite a lot is it's a life is a journey, right? You got the highest of highs and lowest of lows, and 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 part of the journey on the lowest of lows is to embrace, you know, our biggest wounds, right? Such that it's integrated, such that we can then teach other people the lessons as you have just done with us here. So one thing I do actually am curious about is what is the source of your courage? You know, when I say courage, I mean, you know, your, even just with your physical well-being running into a disaster as a, a one component. Another component is the courage to speak up, knowing that others, critics, people who are jealous are going to now look at you as a target potentially, right? So where did you, what's the source of your courage such that you're willing to do the difficult thing, the challenging thing. Well, I think there's a couple of things. I mean, you know, the source of my courage is also a challenge, which is I do have a level of stubbornness when somebody doesn't believe in me. And so, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs have this. And actually the more vocal someone comes out about how they think you're going to fail at something or how you think it's stupid or they think it's inappropriate or you should just keep quiet, the more you're willing to speak out. I have a couple of interesting examples. So at the time with Architecture Humanity, my co-founder and I felt that there was, there was an award that was being given primarily to male architects and they weren't recognizing some of the female partners or, or the female architects in the field. And, and so we spoke out about it. And a board of directors formally reprimanded us for weighing into a subject that, that had nothing to do with our organization. And it was just basically like, you guys just keep quiet about this, right? And so, you know, rather than shut up, we just became more vocal about it because I, it, it, it almost became like a question of like, why would you silence someone for speaking up against this particular issue? I also felt strongly about architects being somewhat culpable in the human rights violations that were happening around the world with large scale development. And the fact that I knew based on some research and some documentation I had done of certain architects who had unknowingly allowed there to be human trafficking in the construction of their buildings. And I wanted to have a very open and honest conversation about the fact that we as an industry are culpable in the trafficking of humans, right? Like we always focus on say sex trafficking, but there's many forms of human trafficking. And when I did that, that ended up becoming a source of, of debate and, and people got very divided about it and certainly put a target on my back. And it was kind of a surprise rather than us having a frank, honest conversation about it having, you know, architects becoming incredibly defensive. So I think it's, I don't know, I, I think you have a belief mechanism and when you get questioned in that belief mechanism and you're willing to back down, maybe you didn't have that belief in the first place. Yeah. Maybe it was I've just heard. an idea that you were exploring. Yeah. I, uh, I love to use uh, Mike Tyson's quote. Everyone thinks they have a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> Our adversity reveals our true character, right? As well as our strength, as well as our weaknesses, as well as our light, as well as our shadow. So yeah, we don't really know until we are challenged, as you said. Yeah. So I'm curious about, because you had said earlier, even during your college days, high school days, even mm -hmm. you said, I'm a global citizen. I'm a global architect. Mm -hmm. I care about the world. Uh, that's very extraordinary. Most people think in terms of the self, this, the, the egoic self first and foremost, and then they'll extend to their family unit, maybe their community, maybe their company. 
maybe their city, state, nation. Very, very few people think or act on the global level. So let's see if I to ask this question. When we operate from things that's outside of our sphere of influence, it's it feel very daunting because I'm not capable of doing or executing this vision that I have. Whereas you already you know, jump both feet in yeah. <laughs> on the global level, uh, even though you were a high school or college student. So tell, tell us a little bit about how you kind of grapple with that internally. No one ever taught me that I come first and that I was always told that we live in a very interconnected world and what we do over here affects things over here. And so I wasn't, you know, I didn't grow up in the smartest household or like the most well-read family, but there was a sense that you know, we're all kind of in this together and we have to figure out a way to move forward. And, you know, sometimes we're going to have a very tight, close family that helps that happen. Other your family is a much broader spectrum of people. And even now, I think my closest friends live in a much more global perspective because I've ended up attracting and I've also found kinship in people that also think very similarly. So I don't know. I think it's funny. I was, I was on a call a couple of weeks ago where the theme of the call was why being selfish is better for everybody. It was like the, the, the premise of the call. Sure. And, and, and the speaker was trying to explain why putting yourself first eventually helps other people. But he prefaced that by saying, without being deeply competitive. So he actually yeah. negated his entire argument because, you know, uh, the part of, about being selfish and, and, and putting yourself first is about creating a competition between you and everything else around you. The moment you say, look, we're not in a competitive landscape, we're figuring out how to work collaboratively, you're not being selfish. So I, I kind of feel like people are, they're, they're made to feel guilty for not being, putting themselves first, right? It, it should, that shouldn't be the default. You shouldn't apologize for putting your fellow man at an equal level. You know, and so I, I don't know, I've just, I just haven't come from a society or from a community or a culture where like, I certainly, again, this plays into like, you know, the downside and being so giving is sometimes you, you, you know, you don't capitalize on the opportunities you have. So yeah. I, I know over the last decade, two decades, I could have made a lot of money. You certainly right? could. And, and most people don't realize like for instance, with Architecture for Humanity, I used to charge for speaking fees. It used to be a big thing in the architecture industry. People get really upset with me. The fact I was, I had CAA as an agent and they were charging five figure fees for me to go and give speeches. But what most people didn't know, and I never explained publicly because I felt like I didn't need to, I didn't have to do that, was 100% of that money was donated to run the organization, right? And it was fivefold of what, well, even tenfold of what my salary was certain years. And it covered a lot of people's salaries that I felt were important to be a part of the organization. That wasn't a selfless act. That was an act of saying, okay, there's a mechanism for me to make money. I can even put it in my bank account. But the thing that I really believe in and care about would end up suffering and choking. And then I, my purpose wouldn't be fulfilled. So I'm going to take this and put it over here, but I'm not going to tell people because it's like, then you muddy the waters of the why, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and for me, it was much better just to be like, okay, this is, you know, the only people that really knew was the COO and the accountants, right? That like all this money was just being diverted into the organization to help underwrite things. So, you know, you know, over the course of, over the course of 10 years, that was close to $1.2, $1.5 million that I decided not to give myself. The TED Prize, I decided not to give myself. 
right? And it wasn't out of being selfless. I think there were selfish reasons I did it, but the selfish reasons were to allow the collective to grow. So yeah. it's it's like the 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 complexity of your decision making. Sometimes there are selfish reasons. Yeah, but those selfish reasons are for the betterment of others. Yeah, I think the egoic mind wants really clean cut answers, black or white. <laughs> But really, I mean, we use the yin yang, you know, we use spectrum kind of probabilistic type analysis quite a lot on this podcast. Rarely mm -hmm. things are black and white. It's shades of gray and you pick the one that is going to forward your purpose, your mission, your core values. So, so thanks for sharing that. Appreciate it. Yeah. Mm. So many questions. What should I ask? It's funny because we said we bet we barely would make it to 45 minutes and here we are at minute 45 and you're like, I have so many questions. <laughs> yeah, I, I still I still have so many questions. Well, I mean, do you mind staying a little longer or are we no, not, we at, all, not at all? I'm more than happy to stay on. Oh, thank you so much. Appreciate it. So so in terms of right, so I want to get to a sort of a completion point in terms of sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. So my assertion is when you are acting beyond your sphere of influence, it's very frustrating, it's daunting, it's, it's challenging, right? At the same time, you want to. Mm -hmm. So in terms of your experience in working with Creative Commons, open collaboration, do you have a, a, like a rubric, like a tactic or a mental model to help someone to say, hey, I do care about the global community. At the same time, I'm also limited with my resources. Where, what part should I act upon? Should I just? Well, I, mean, I would say I'm probably not the best person to answer that because, you know, obviously economically has not worked out in my favor many times where I've just ended up like, you know, but, you know, I feel like compared to a lot of people's stories, I've lived a lifetime every five years. Right, the experiences I've had and the things, the places I've been and the opportunities I've had have been really remarkable and incredible. Have I been able to put that all in a bank and being able to like buy houses and buy car? Like I don't own a car, right? In in a few in a month or so, I won't have an apartment. You know, the homeless humanitarian, and you know, but what that's what that time has taught me, what the last twenty years has taught me is to figure out what is the thing that I actually want to make that is like, which taps into the ideals of open source and the ideals of collaboration, but also allows there to be kind of some sort of economic engine to allow me to have security. So, you know, I feel like, and we talked a little bit about this, you know, private if you actually have any specific questions that you have for Cameron, please uh, enter in the comment area. So that way we know we can guide the question to the, a specific thing that you wanted to do or challenges that you have. Otherwise, I'll continue on with our inquiry about what it takes to be a humanitarian, social philanthropist, a social entrepreneur. So we talked about how the difference between a startup and a stay through and what does it mean to be uh, to take a different mindset on being an entrepreneur do you want me to continue yes please please elaborate okay okay so so what i've been doing for my last for the last 35 years of my life but professionally the last 20 years <clears throat> has not changed it's not been like I haven't started a Jello company and then started a car company and then started like a stapler company, right? And and we know friends who have done that. You know, you you meet someone they're like, yeah, I had a restaurant business and then I started this thing that was making skateboards out of recycled plastic bottles from the ocean. And you're just like, how do you go? But you know, I've been very consistent in the things I wanted to do. And it's like one overarching journey that's about how do we create, you know, better ways of living for the world, right? And that doesn't necessarily mean architecture, but 
what is the what is the systems that we need to put in place to have a better way of living life based on the world that we're living in right now because the world that we lived in in 1945 is very different from what 2025 is going to look like and so you know along that line there's a period where i did a nonprofit i did a for purpose design studio i worked for a foundation and now i'm i have a hybrid organization that's doing some work philanthropically but also i'm coming up with a a for profit venture which is more to do with kind of direct engagement around architecture and living and so and that you know will launch very soon but like if you'd asked me 10 years ago what are you interested in it'd be the exactly the same thing i'm interested in now is how do we create buildings and communities that create betterment for society and for those that occupy the the buildings themselves so you know i the idea of startup sounds like i have an idea i want to get it out there and if it gets funded then i'm going to believe in that idea that to me is crazy it's crazy right it's kind of like saying like i think i like mango ice cream i'm going to launch a campaign for me to try mango ice cream and then you eat it and you're like nah just didn't work out just just couldn't get it together i'm really into pistachio now right you know it's it just you know for me it's like when you have a a real purpose driven company or purpose driven philanthropy has legs and it and it's come it's evolved and it's moved and it's so yeah the the that to, that to me is the stay through what so what i hear you say you didn't say this but this this is that internal faith internal belief that this will go the way that i want it to go but you at the same time you're not attached to the mechanisms that's going to help fulfill this purpose is that accurate absolutely i mean you know i trained to be an architect and i tried to work in the field of architecture and then i worked into the field of philanthropy and i've worked in other fields where i've used the idea of building or creating space as a way to better people's lives and if you took a legal definition 80% of what i do, did was not architecture no so no so but it still had the same the same thread mm. and so yeah i i you know if you take somebody like steve jobs mm. you know and i make these analogies the elon musk the steve jobs you know it's not like he you know when he invented or when he was part of the team that invented the iPhone or the iPad or even the iMac right some of the 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 kernels of understanding and the philosophy of it was the same as when he did the Apple IIe and the Lisa mm -hmm. right that was that was that was and so you know you know there's a lot of great innovators out there that they just need to find the right time to have their solution discovered and 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 that's what luck is it's perseverance and strength to believe an idea that will suddenly get elevated into the social conscience and most people don't understand that they just say oh he was lucky she got really lucky with that idea nobody got lucky with an idea maybe that idea was created yesterday and it entered the social consciousness in 24 hours maybe that idea was 24 years ago and it entered the social consciousness today right it's the same it's almost the same amount of tenacity and work it's what you do with it once you get recognized yeah it's that uh, overnight success takes 10 20 years for overnight success to happen yeah. right and 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 i think it's important to recognize those people that do have overnight successes mm. then spend the next 10 to 20 years evolving that success yeah you know the other day i was on the call with a guy who invented the jelly belly the jelly beans oh okay and he's having a revival because he last year decided to put cbd in the jelly bellies Ah, smart. I love it. <laughs> yeah. So, he's reinvented the same thing. I mean, 
and his philosophy on the company and what he does is exactly the same. He's just adapted his company to the current circumstance. So let's so, talk about that for a moment. Cause you reinvented yourself multiple, multiple times. And on the spiritual level, I believe that to live a purpose driven life is to hold our identities loosely, right? Mm -hmm. To hold the, the, the beliefs loosely, not to let it go altogether, but also don't hold it on so tight to be so attached to my old identities that any kind of new ideas is going to trigger a defensive response. So you have reinvented yourself many, many times. Can you share with us, um, looking at the highest of highs and the lowest of lows and your roller coaster experience of reinventing yourself? What are some of the felt sensations or indicators to yourself to say, Hmm, it's time to end or it's time to push through. You know what I mean? It's more like, are you evolving or are you kind of like going through a, a rebirth or renewal, right? You know, cause reinventing sometimes means an evolution and sometimes it's like literally a reincarnation, right? <laughs> you know, you come back as a different animal and, and that happens in life. And there are moments where I question everything I'm doing and then it's time to, to be reincarnated. It's, I mean, and that doesn't mean that your core philosophies and your ideas change. It just means that the circumstances that you suggest you find yourself in are just not working. And that doesn't mean that you then say, well, I, I'm not responsible for things in the past. We all own our histories and you have to continue to own that history. But, you know, you just, you know, you feel it in, you feel it in your gut and you feel it in your head when it's time to change. But when it's time to evolve, you feel it in your gut and you feel it in your heart, right? Oh. It is unstoppable. And it's almost like no matter what people are saying that you cannot do this, you are driven well beyond what your mind can think. Your mind has to catch up, right? Your, your heart is saying, your gut is saying like, let's do this. Your heart is like, this is it. You got it. You got to double down. Your head is like, wait, wait, I haven't figured this all out. Right. And so like, whereas when you're like, something's wrong here you're really thinking about all the challenges and you know how is this affecting certain people and you know and and are you proud or not proud of the decisions that you made you know have you had to compromise i think in some of the instances where i kind of what i would say re re re-emerged as a new person i really questioned a lot of the decision making that i had to make because i had to it was like the best of a bad situation and the moment that you have the best of a bad situation, you're in a bad situation, right? No one stops to say, wait a minute. Like I have two difficult choices. Like maybe making that choice is the wrong question to ask. Maybe mm. the right question is why am I making this decision when I know that both options are bad, mm -hmm. right? And maybe the entire thing just doesn't work. And so, it could be a personal relationship. It doesn't have, mm -hmm. I mean, we haven't even delved into personal relationships, mm -hmm. but like it could be a personal relationship or it could be a professional relationship. And, mm -hmm. you know, you end up realizing that you're hurting too many people by trying to make the best worst choice. Mm -hmm. And that shouldn't be how life is. Mm -hmm. So let's actually follow that theme for a moment. So if I look at two schools of thought regarding humanitarian work as an example, Mm -hmm. One would be, there's a lot of shit that's broken. Let me go fix broken stuff. That's one mm -hmm. way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is forget about the broken stuff. Let's just invent a new future. That's so compelling. People are like, oh, I want that. Let me forego the old paradigm with the old way of doing things. Mm -hmm. What is your thought about one or the other or neither? Well, the first one brings disappointment because you've just fixed something that you know is going to break again. So people are still a little bit, you know, they're just like, oh, we still have to do this. The problem with the utopian, like future proofing solution that's going to leapfrog you to the next, you know, like, I, like a good example, I love UBI. I think universal basic in income is a fantastic way to think about how we allow a whole society to live a 
you know, a, a baseline existence, right? With, with the resources and the wealth that's in the ground and in the air. But the systems of capitalism are so deeply rooted in so many systems that for UBI to like take off, it has to push capitalism through an understanding, right? Of like, the future is here. This is what it looks like. So at the moment, there's lots of these little experiments, whether they're here in Hudson, New York, or they're in, you know, Stockton or other areas of the United States, where people are doing little experiments to show the solution, how the solution can work. So you have to kind of coax the past into the future. You know, in 2000, you can look at even look this up in 2001, there was an interview that was in the New York Times with the UN and myself. And the title of the, of the article was we've got tents. We've got talents. We have tents, T E N T tents. Uh -huh. tents. And this yeah. was in, in, in reference to refugees. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for the last 20 years, the UN has said, well, we have tents. We don't need anything else. And the humanitarian world has says a refugee camp isn't camping. Right. It's not a joyful experience. These people are there for a decade. You cannot be building tents. You have to figure out an urban planning strategy that is about building temporary cities that will evolve and emerge. You cannot do this. But the UN doesn't believe that because that system doesn't exist. So you have to eventually slowly pull them along. And, you know, I've been a harsh, harsh critic of better shelter, which is the IKEA funded solution. But to be honest, they actually tried to do that. They didn't build a, temp a permanent solution. They didn't build a tent. They built something that was midway in between that allowed the UN to see what the future looked like. So, you know, it's very rare that there's a leapfrog technology. Like everyone's like, yeah, we got smartphones. And then we, we had this like, great moment. Well, guess what? Before this, there was Palm Pilots, there were razors, there were there was all sorts of semi smartphones, where we were I, I remember having something from T Mobile, which was like, you would flip the screen. That's and right. Would, yeah. Yeah, with you know, and it was like, literally, the screen was this big, it was like a lozenge. And it was a horrible phone. But I could send a text message to somebody. That was mm -hmm. it. Right. So there's been intermediary technologies that have driven us to the new, new future. So, yeah, I think it's really hard. What, what tends to happen is those pioneering people that do the leapfrog technologies never financially benefit from it because they're too far ahead of everybody else. Mm -hmm. And so they end up taking all the liability and the risk for everybody mm -hmm. else and their company probably will fail. Mm -hmm. So and this comes from a, this comes from a history. So my father, there were three companies in the world that was that were really focused on photo archiving and imaging. Mm -hmm. One of them was Kodak. Mm -hmm. One of them was called Leaf. And the other was my father's. Mm -hmm. And my father was way ahead of everyone else. And he would invent stuff all the time. But, you know, it turns out that he was like 10 years ahead of everybody. And as a result, Getty Images and Corbis and others, other photo archiving systems came into place after these three companies. My father's company went under, Kodak went bankrupt, and I don't even know if Leaf exists anymore. But like these were three companies that like hedged their bets into this future and were just too, too ahead of the game. Mm. So I have a question and, and then we'll probably will complete this for the moment. Then we'll do a part three, hopefully. Yeah. Is this everything that you learned the last 20 years, you are going after a really gnarly challenge, shall we say, or, or, or juicy depends on which way you look at it. Right. Yeah. Um, to empower the 99%, the neglected, the poorest or the most vulnerable populations to have temporary housing solutions mm -hmm. and that requires that that in itself requires a very complicated issue because it's a local issue requires local politicians governance investors communities involved 
gnarly, right? And in, in every local situation is different. And, and mass, massive personal blowback because people say this phrase as if it's a negative phrase. They say, oh, you're nothing but a do-gooder. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, just want to like, you know, one of those guys who just wants to help the planet, right? Oh, you're in this just to get your name out there. Right. Mm -hmm. Rather than saying like you're dedicating your entire existence towards this solution. You know, the we've somehow turned helping your fellow man as a negative thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even in the media, when someone says like do good design mm -hmm. you know, or do good innovation or do good housing, mm -hmm. it also infers that everything else is bad. And mm. so people that are professionals then take it as a critic. Like if you get, and, and this happened to me my, for, for years, when someone would give me some award or something that said I was a do-good architect, so many famous, very well-known architects would get upset and would be verbally dismissive as if I was somehow saying that their work was not good, that I was just helping helping poor people and those people will, are willing to take anything. And so, mm. you know, I think it's not just the complexity of doing the work. It's the fact that you're willing to have your entire reputation and personal bias against you be dismissive. Yeah. Because it's weird that somebody is willing to do that. Hence my earlier point to your courage to continue to do this, right? Cause it's, it's not like you do that. I mean, from an outsider point of view, you could easily do something else and make a lot of money and just just that, right? But but you that's not the only currency that you care about. You care about making a yeah. difference in people's lives. I was offered a job about three years ago uh, to work for a startup company, making a lot of money a lot of money figuring out their social impact. Mm -hmm. But at the same time I was working on these schools on the Syrian border where I wasn't getting paid to fundraise, but the idea of the project in Syria Oh, it's going well there. So the yeah. idea was so compelling, even though I wouldn't be financially benefited, it was more important for me to finish that and not take the other job, mm -hmm. you know, lipstick on the pig, right? It was, it was, you know, false advertising. So, and I wouldn't have been true to myself to the other project because that's not why I did the project. So I, I, I think, you know, people are very dismissive. It's not courage. It's, do you value yourself? Mm. And when that value gets questioned, are you willing to fold and bend because of it? Mm, mm, mm. Right. Mm. I love that. So when, yeah. when someone says, you know, they question you like, you know, how can you raise a family or how can you be a decent kind of parent? Because, you know, you could have just taken a job with lots of money and your kid could go to some fancy college. I'm hoping at some point that my kid realizes that I took the more difficult road because my core values dictated me to do that. And it was the right thing to do, even yeah. if it caused kind of uh, financial and, 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 uh, and social ch challenging situations. Yeah. The hardest thing and also the simplest thing people say is know thyself. That to me is one of the, the life's challenge, really know thyself and operate and behave and say and do things based on how you have determined to live. And then you, my friend, have, for me, an outsider point of view, do that. And that's what I meant, courage. It's not necessarily yeah. the external challenge, but the courage to face the criticisms, the self-doubts, the, the, the difficulties, the judgment from within and without, right? Yeah. Well, I, it, it's taken 45 years of making mistakes and learning. And, and, and I, and knowing that I'll make many more, mm -hmm. but, um, it's a life's journey and it ended tomorrow. I know that I would have done the best of my ability up until that moment. 
And, mm. you know, if I get another 20 or 30 years, then there's a lot more for me to do. If I get another 40 years, there's an incredible amount of work that I need to get done in order to feel satisfied and to be kind of truly fulfilled internally. Beautiful. So I have a very challenging question for you. If someone who is watching this, they're inspired by your story, your commitment, your journey of all these things that you've done, right? The highest of highs, as well as the lowest of loads, knowing everything that you know now, if they want to make a difference in the humanitarian architectural realm, what are three or five things that you will mm -hmm. recommend them to start thinking about before the they embark on that path? The first and most important thing is understanding that you need deep empathy for the very people you're trying to help and that their stories are much more complex than you've been told and that their histories are embedded in their future. The second is there's nothing worse than showing up with an idea and walking away. It brings false hope to a community, mm. right? If I've been asked, you know, just in the last two, two days to work on Navajo nation and work on Pine Ridge and elsewhere. I'm not committing to them because I don't have the capacity to actually follow through because I don't have the funding or the resources right now. When I do, I can commit. And that's a conversation that starts, but so many designers come in with a passionate idea and they present it and the community gets excited and they turn around and say, but I don't have the money. I don't have the resources. Let's see what we can do. And then false hope is given. Mm. The third is be willing to do anything that the community does. A story in, in that is I lived up in the northern part of Mongolia with uh, a tribe of reindeer herders. Mm. And on the first night, you know, I drank reindeer mil milk and I ate reindeer just like everyone else. And I had to learn how to play a Mongolian form of poker and drink a lot of vodka to make it through to the next day. And only <laughs> then did we start having a conversation, mm. right? Mm. The mixture of strange milk, uh, well, I was going to say fermented milk, strange mm. meat, mm. vodka, and gambling is not what I signed up for, but that's mm. what the community wanted to do. And it was their test of saying like, are you willing to come to the table for us? And then the final thing I think is the, the more you get done in this life, the more detractors you're going to have. And the more that people will pull you down on a surface level and diminish what you do, because it seems implausible or impossible what you've been able to achieve. And so, and you're going to have failures too. And it's really interesting to see the people that will, they'll be much more vocal when you're going through your toughest moments and they're not helpful at all when you need help, right? And I know this with even close friends who, when I've asked for a donation to help on a project, they said, no, no, I'm busy. My startup is trying to do a, a round. We, we need to raise a few million. I'm busy. And then when I've worked on something and it's not worked out, they're the first people to say like, look, you see this nonprofit stuff doesn't work. So you have to understand that sometimes there's, there's people in your close circle, even family, that will take delight in seeing you go through challenging circumstances. So. That's not ending on a high, but it's ending on a reality. So. No, I mean, this is great, right? Because I think if people just look at your Instagram stream, you know, they get a false idea of your day-to-day -day life, right? You're hanging out with, you know, Ted or, right? Hanging out with really talented people. At the same time, there's the actual gritty reality of being a social um, entrepreneur. Um, yeah. I think what you just share, share some of the gritty reality is actually what it takes to bring those ideas to reality, you know, not just the personal, mm -hmm. but also the social, but also being with the locals, but actually seeing the grittiness of the challenge that they face in disaster zones and so forth. So this is exactly why I like to do this kind of long form conversation versus let's say a soundbite you know, and Ted staged kind of a thing for me personally, that's this yeah. is the reason well, why I, I do that. that for people who are inspired by your story, 
what you're up to with Jube and with Frontline Care, where should they follow you? You can go to givefrontlinecare.org or actually very soon you could go to worldchanging.com. I'm kind of like in the midst of redoing everything. We're kind of stealth on a few things and hopefully we can go public by the end of the fall. But follow my Instagram and direct message me. As you know, I'm willing to try almost anything as you've coaxed me into doing on a number of times. Um, so, oh, so yeah, I'm okay. Well, my friend, I just really appreciate you as a new friend, as a new colleague, as well as uh, just a, a fellow human being who is, from my point of view, without a doubt, really dedicated to walk your own purpose life, regardless of all the ups and all the downs in the circumstances that you face. So thank you for just embodying that warrior spirit, right? That's why the reason why I want to talk to other noble warriors. So thank you for being who you are. Well, thank you so much. And here's to, here's to trying to wrap somewhere in the future. <laughs> Beautiful, my friend.